Good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of 2024 in session 6 of the Qualities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have no apologies. Our first agenda item is consideration of a continued petition, PE 1787, the use of Makaton sign language in the legal system. And I refer members to paper one. At our meeting late February last year, committee members discussed how much further we could progress this petition given its narrow scope. We ultimately kept the petition open to seek further information as outlined in paragraph three of the paper. That information is summarised in paragraphs five and six. The clerks recently received an update from Scottish Government officials and that update is included in full as an annex to the paper and is summarised in paragraphs eight to ten of the paper. We are invited to consider whether to close the petition at this point. While there is no set guidance specifically on the use of Makaton in the legal system, there are a number of policies, duties and practices in place which are designed to ensure relevant authorities provide as much support as possible for people to communicate in a way which is most accessible to them. Can I ask members if they have any thoughts? No. Are we all agreed to close the petition? Yes. yes. We are therefore agreed to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis that there are a number of measures in place to make communication as accessible as possible and there may be further opportunities for the petitioner and others to highlight consideration of Makaton in future legislation, including the Scottish Human Rights Bill. I want to thank the petitioner, Sandra Doherty, for lodging this petition and for helping to raise awareness of Makaton. We will now suspend briefly to prepare for our next agenda item. Thank you. Our next agenda item is an evidence session on suicide prevention in Scotland and I refer members to papers two and three and I welcome to the meeting this morning Rob Gowans, Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, Neil Mathers, Executive Director, Samaritan Scotland, John Gibson, Chief Executive Officer, the Camworth Trust, Don Farthing, Head of Suicide Prevention, Scottish Action for Mental Health, Jason Schroeder, Chief Executive Officer, Scottish Men's Set Sheds Association. Rebecca Hoffman, National Policy Lead, LGBT Health and Wellbeing. Aidan Mitchell, Policy and Public Affairs Officer, Change Mental Health. Dr Richmond Davies, Head of Public Health Analytics and Intelligence, Public Health Scotland. As we have a large number of witnesses this morning, which is great to see, we have a lot to cover on this important topic. So I'm afraid we don't have time for opening statements, but you're all very welcome um, to join us today. And we're really grateful um, for the responses for our calls to view also, that I want to note. We will now move on to questions and I, I'm going to open up the question in here. And I'd like to ask, in your view, what impact has been made by the Scottish Government's previous suicide prevention initiatives, given the increase in deaths by suicide over the course of the Every Life Matters strategy? 
If I could start with you, Rob, please. Would you like to come in? So I suppose the um, relation to sort of um, some of the previous strategies, um, I think there's um, there's sort of um, quite a few things that um, that sort of have been done before, and I think this reflecting on um, sort of some of the lived experience work that we we did previously. Um, I think the sort of the the sort of latest strategy, choosing hope together, is welcome. It contains a lot of um, you know really good content. Um, I think there's um, a good consideration of equalities and human rights and an engagement with lived experience. I think probably um, in common with, with other strategies, um, a lot of what will determine whether it's successful is the, is the action based on it and, um, and the funding that's attached to that. And I think I would say particularly for, for sort of third sector organisations who play a huge part um, in, in sort of suicide prevention and working with people um, in, on an early intervention basis. Thank you. Would anyone like to come in on this? Can I come to you, Neil? Thank yeah. you. Um, I think we would say that previous suicide prevention initiatives have left a, a legacy of quite valuable work um, over the, the last couple of decades. I think maybe highlighting uh, the fact that suicide training has been um, delivered and to a wider network of, of people, including Safe Talk, Assist, Mental Health First Aid Training, the creation of the social movement, I think particularly through United to Prevent Suicide, has had a particular impact, introduction of time, space, compassion as an approach to embed in a wider range of different organisations and frontline services. Uh, and I think a good foundation of, the, of, of beginning to engage um, people's lived and living experience of suicide uh, in the work, but I think it has to be said that the, the reduction in deaths by suicide hasn't shifted uh, over the last, significantly over the last 10 years, so there's, there's much to be done. And I think particularly the suicide rates when you're looking at people who uh, are living in more deprived areas compared to those in least deprived areas is still 2.6 times higher. Uh, and the, the rates for, for men is still three times higher. So those, those haven't shifted. Well, thank you, Neil. John, would you like to... Yeah, I would just reiterate uh, what has been said. Um, the previous iterations of uh, our uh, plan for suicide reduction are amazing pieces of work, as is this one. Um, but we have to kick off with the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is, as Neil has just described, we are not shifting... Um, suicide rates in Scotland, uh, not indeed across the United Kingdom, um, and we can't shy away from that. So there's a huge amount of fantastic work being done. This new uh, Creating Hope Together strategy is an outstanding piece of work, and doubtless we'll come to that, but we cannot but kick off by acknowledging that we are not currently shifting the high rates of suicide in our country. Thank you. And it's Dan? I'll, I'll try and avoid just repeating uh, my, but I would associate ourselves with the, with the comments that have already been made. Um, the, in addition to that, I'd add that it's important to remember with Every Life Matters that where it came from before that, when the, the approach that was taken then did mark a change in the uh, cross-sectoral working, bringing voices from outside government into the process and, and had an additional focus, which I think was lacking before Every Life Matters. Um, so it is important to recognise that work in, in bringing us together and starting to lay the infrastructure in the way that Neil was describing um, the, the LLEP, uh, what well, the LEP, the Lived Experience Panel, now the Lived and Living Experience Panel, and some of the other infrastructure we've built, it gets us to a point where, as John says, the documents we're working with are very strong, but we, so we've got good foundations, but it's really where we go next and if we're going to actually tackle the figures that, that have already been highlighted that's so important. Okay, thank you. Um, Jason, would you like to come in on that? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, all I can say basically is um, the level of um, support that we've had uh, around this um, over the last 10 years um, unfortunately hasn't been substantially good enough. And so the delivery to, and we're only talking about men here, um, unfortunately is lacking. And I'm hopefully today what can be spoken of is why we've got to this situation, understanding the psychological differences and how we can deliver and are delivering, but getting no support. Okay, thank you. Rebecca. Hi, thank you. Um, 
We just like to add, from a from an equalities perspective, to date, previous Scottish government suicide prevention initiatives have had limited positive impact on reducing suicidal ideation of, or mental distress within the LGBT community. Um, previous action plans and strategies haven't necessarily made tangible commitments or recognised um, suicidal ideation within LGBT groups or minori minoritised communities. Um, all the while, conditions for LGBT people have worsened, and this is reflected in our own internal statistics from our annual service evaluation, which placed suicidal ideation at 40% for LGBT people in 2016, 46% in 2018, 58% in 2021, 61% in 2022, and 64% in 2023. I think historically, the responsibility of supporting the LGBT community has landed on organisations like LGBT Health and Kinship Networks um, and those that are activists within the community as well, um, rather than prevention-based work. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Eden. Hi. I think in terms of, of impact, if we look between 2002 and 2006 and then 2013 to 2017, the national rate of deaths from suicide decreased by 20%. Um, under previous strategies. However, we've seen in recent years that stalling and now um, the suicide rate um, increased again to 15 per 100,000 in, in 2019. It's now standing at 14.4 as of 2022. And I suppose, as, as other colleagues have, have mentioned, the, the rates for suicide in male has been consistently three times as much as females, and we haven't been able to break that link as of yet. Similarly, with levels of deprivation We've seen that the rates, um, the difference in mortality rate by deprivation has been fairly stable since 2001, um, another link that we've not been able to, to break. And I think some of the, the um, impacts of the previous strategies um, have been around funding. Uh, so the Choose Life strategy was, was backed by £20.4 million pounds over from 2003 to 2008, um, which led to that decrease in suicide deaths. So I think we need to see um, similar levels of funding going forward in order to match that. Thank you. Dr Davies. Yeah, so um, I echo um, all what has been said earlier on. Uh, and I think that the previous suicide prevention strategy, Every Life Matters, it's kind of laid the foundations for what has now happened because the current strategy uses a slightly different approach. It's outcomes based. It, 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 um, it involves um, expertise in academia, uh, practice, and also with lived experience. So it uses a, a, a slightly different approach, and we will be mo monitoring the the outcomes on you know for in in a direction of travel to see how we are moving forward in this new strategy. However. Public Health Scotland, you know, based on the previous strategy, has been producing the, the guidance on, on, on clusters, on suicide clusters, locations of concern, and, and also how to manage memorials as well, because those, the, those monuments kind of attract um, even increased numbers of suicide. So yes, um, we are building on the previous strategy, and we are moving forward to make it even better. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I note, in particular, yourself, Rebecca, spoke about the LGBT community, how you, you felt that was maybe um, something that wasn't picked up on in, in the last strategy. Do you think there are, can I ask um, all the witnesses, are there any gaps that you feel weren't addressed that perhaps this new strategy um, will address? Would you like to come in, Neil? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, one of the, the key differences with this strategy is that the first time that the strategy has not only tried to ha have a, a mission to reduce deaths by suicide, but also to tackle inequalities. I think that's vitally important. And a key part of delivering on, on that is to, to have a, a focus on a whole government and whole society approach. And certainly as Samaritan Scotland, we're, we're proud to be part of delivering on, on that as strategic outcome lead for, for outcome one. Um, so we, we understand that in order to 
um, reduce death by suicide, we, we also need to, need to understand the, the link between inequalities and suicide risk. So having a strategy that focuses on addressing those is, is vitally important. Thank you. Uh, Dr Davies. So, so I, I think the strategy has a, a focus on prevention. So um, pre prevention as a, as a public health approach works. Um, the evidence is very, very clear about how it works, where you, you deal with the building blocks of, of mental health and well-being, um, which are quite upstream, and then that trickles down mm -hmm. to have an effect on what is happening downstream. So, so I think the approach is different this time. Okay. Yep. And Aidan, thank you. I think we um, welcome the reference to tackling inequality and the vision and the guiding principles of Creating Hope Together. I think it is unrealistic to expect the strategy to reduce inequalities themselves um, and there needs to be wider work across government. So Audit Scotland's 2023 report on adult mental health acknowledged that mental health services cannot address these inequalities alone and they were not yet working closely enough with other sectors such as housing, welfare and employability to address and prevent some of the causes of poor mental health which leads to higher suicide rates. And while the strategy commits to a whole government and whole society approach, it specifically draws on non-mental health funding and resources to, to support suicide prevention, for example, policies at child poverty and substance abuse and use and debt, advising they'll continue to develop this approach. So I think we need to see a bit more detail about how those non-mental health um, funding policies are, are working to support the work. Okay, that's really important. Would anybody else like to come in on that? Um, I, I'd like to look at perhaps um, you've, you've mentioned some challenges there that might be facing in, in the new strategy Aiden, you spoke there about you know there needs to be this this particular joined up thinking across um, sectors as well and across um, we're not just firefighting we're getting to the crux of what's causing that in the first instance are there any challenges you see within this strategy that that also might appear any any weak points that you would like to point out John yeah, thank you. Um, in my previous life, I was a biological researcher, um, and one of the things that's challenged me in coming to the suicide community has been the lack of research on potential models, biological models, um, around suicide. And it's an international issue, it's not just a UK or, or Scottish issue. But you will see in Rory O'Connor's IMV, his uh, Integrated Motivational Volitional Model, which is so pr prominent in the, the, the documentation, that there's a word called diathesis, um, and it's a word that everybody talks about but actually does very little with. So I guess diathesis means, is there an underlying biological risk for suicide? Um, and I guess if that's true, then we can throw all we like by way of uh, strategy at this. But if we're not dealing with biological diathesis, then we have a problem. And uh, where I'm delighted to say that the Canmore Trust is, is funding with a major Scottish university to open up research into that diathesis um, and to determine whether there are, are any biological models for this. And, and it's a really important point because we deal with families where there have been five, six suicides over two or three generations. And there is actually very little in the literature about genetic studies, familial studies. Um, and it's, it's easy for the psychologist to say this is clustering because it's about a behavioural model. Mm -hmm. But actually, until you've got a contralateral argument to say, well, it might be biological, you can't actually draw that conclusion. So I think one of the things that we really need to address is biological modelling um, and research funding into biological modelling for suicide diathesis. Okay, thank you, John. Um, would anyone else like to come in on perhaps what they would have hoped to have seen in this strategy? Or anything that feels missing. Jason. Thanks. I would have hoped, um, and it's a conversation that doesn't seem to happen very much, unfortunately, um, is that we're not all the same. As in John was saying about our differences and our biological differences between men and women in this instance. And we can see that there's a, a major difference between um, the masculine and the feminine, as in the outcomes of suicide. So clearly there's something different going on and it can't be addressed in the same way as a different, as the same solution because it's not working. So with our movement, we have delved very deeply into um, the masculine, obviously. 
and where our society has brought or failed over the last two, three hundred years in the strong and silent type masculine model, which is clearly failing us, and why I believe we're in this situation right now. And I would have hoped that possibly in this, um, that there was a discussion point um, in the different sectors um, of people that we would be brave enough to be able to <coughs> identify and say it's okay to be different and to accept that there has to be different strategies to success here. And that's okay. It's not one size fits all. And I didn't, I didn't see that at all. Thank you. Anyone else? Rebecca. Hi, um, thank you. I'd just like to add that um, for LGBT people specifically, the factors that contribute to suicide and suicidal ideation are multifaceted and are frequently attributed to minority stress and multiple minority stress. And that is experiences of external stressors, such as systemic discrimination, stigma, ostracization, violence, hate incidents and hate crimes, and queer phobia, um, and a lack of access to equitable, equitable or timely healthcare. Um, I think a recognition of the impacts of minority stress and a commitment to a truly intersectional approach that recognises um, all protected characteristics at risk of suicide, but also um, at risk groups in general would have been greatly appreciated. And we do recognise um, that the strategy does take a human rights-based approach and we do commend its commitment um, to you know, interweaving timescales time, space, compassion and other um, ongoing pieces of work, but we would have liked to have seen a bit more. Thanks. Thank you. So everyone, I'm going to now move on to questions from Marie, please. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, Rebecca, I wanted that to sort of find out how much your organisation has been involved in facilitating que questions and conversations uh, between the Scottish Government and those with lived uh, experience, and those obviously um, have living experience of suicide as well to develop the strategy? Um, so overall, organisationally, our involvement was pretty limited. Um, we were involved with the mental health and wellbeing strategy and we hosted a session where the then mental health and wellbeing minister attended our offices to meet with LGBT people um, who had experiences with mental health. Um, we had tried to engage with the suicide prevention team in delivering the strategy, but we weren't successful. Um, we submitted a consultation response jointly with the Equality Network to highlight the inequalities experienced by LGBT people. Um, and we're now working more closely with the suicide prevention team and those at COSLA um, responsible for delivering the strategy. And although we are in some way disappointed by the outcome of it, whilst also recognising its strengths, um, we are optimistic going forward that hopefully um, there will be tangible action for our community and other minoritised communities. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Dan, do you want to come in and sort of fill me in the, uh, your involvement, um, your organisation's involvement in it? So in the, in the um, discriminated, discriminated against groups specifically or lived experience more broadly? Lived experience, yeah. So, um, We've been very pleased in the old action plan to be involved in, in building some of that infrastructure that I was talking to you about before. So as, uh, as Neil mentioned, the, the social movement's been very important. That was obviously uh, initiated in the last social movement, uh, in the last uh, action plan. Um, and the lived and living experience panel has really been the heart of the approach to lived experience. There's also a youth advisory group, uh, which, which was formed shortly after, after that. Um, and the approach that's been taken through the lived and lived experience panel was really almost co-designed with that first panel um, and the principles uh, that it established for lived experience engagement, which, is, which has been taken on board across the suicide prevention work. Um, they've been recognised by the World Health Organisation as best practice. Um, and we really are indebted to the members of that first panel for the work that they've done to establish that. Um, and the benefit of that is being seen already with the new panel. So a new panel has recently been recruited, um, which is, is just bedding in now, uh, and some of that learning that was that was won and, and hard fought for in the original uh, panel uh, is really bearing fruit, I think. Um, but one of the things that first panel's really established is the value of the voice of lived experience in the work. Um, I, we were talking earlier about the, the different points of expertise coming into the panel, and I think it's unarguable that the lived experience panel has demonstrated the voice uh, the, the value of the voice of lived experience. But I think the challenge that's ahead of us 
is that it's only the panel itself is you know less than 20 people um, so its ability to deal with some of the, the, the diversity issues and the equality issues is, is naturally limited and we've really got to find a way of bringing in not not just um, the the groups that are in legislation to be protected but the other groups that are where there's a clear marginalization discrimination against I think we've got to be more overt about talking about people who face discrimination and that as a driver uh, to, to, the, to the suicidal ideation and, and other suicidation. So there we've, made, we've laid good foundations and Sam is very pleased to be involved in that, but it's really the people with lived experience that have, have pushed that forward themselves. Um, and there's opportunities now with the, with the, uh, the expansion, uh, you know, taking forward of the social movement. And also we think there's probably room for a, some work in between some people who are more regularly engaged through the social movement at a slightly deeper layer of, of engagement to enable us to look specifically at groups that, whose voices haven't been loud enough in the work so far, um, which, of which there are a rather a, a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of groups where you, there's a really powerful case that there's an increased risk um, and increased challenges and, and unique challenges that really need to be understood. Thanks for that. Rob, do you want to comment at all on, on that in terms of you know, your involvement you know, with uh, facilitating conversations with the Scottish Government? Yeah, so I, I think... Um, um, we had quite a lot of um, involvement in facilitating lived experience for previous strategies and um, we've done a bit for the, um, the sort of mental health and well-being strategy through um, the Versus Experiences Advisory Panel, which we, we run with um, the Mental Health Foundation. Um, I think in general, um, we would uh, sort of strongly... Um, recommend that lived experience is engaged throughout the process, not just in, in terms of creating the strategy. Um, and I think, as it alluded to, that it takes a, a sort of an equalities lens and an intersectional lens um, to speak to um, kind of particular groups who are, who are most at risk um, as sort of actions are developed. Um, I think sort of, um, sort of engaging sort of lived experience has um, we've sort of seen sort of huge benefits in our, our sort of work and um, and in terms of the the amount of um, really good insight that um, the kind of Scottish government and others can can get from um, experience panels but um, it's something that um, that um, as uh, Dad's alluded to takes a lot of work and a lot of um, engagement but um, it's it's sort of well worth doing across um, across the, the the whole of the strategy to inform inform the actions. Sure. Anyone else want to come in, John? I, I can speak directly as a member of the mm. lived experience panel. So I and I come at this uh, from uh, direct experience, having lost my son to suicide in 2019, and then made an attempt on my life in 2020. Um, so this is not. Um, theoretical stuff for me. This is hard-hitting, um, appalling stuff. Um, and all I can say to you is that I joined the lived and living, sorry, the lived experience panel halfway through its previous iteration, and I've stayed on to the current panel. And uh, again, speaking as a previ previously as an academic, I came to this um, and I was gobsmacked that here was a government that were offering uh, not just academic understanding, but lived and living experience equally allowed at the table. And believe me, from the world that I come from, that is dramatic and wonderful. So I, I have to say, that, as an initiative, that in itself, again commended by the World Health Organization, is a fantastic approach to the work that is being done. Um, and, and so lived and now living experience uh, is absolutely at the heart of, of what's going on. And I completely take what Rebecca's saying, that representation within the lived and living experience panel probably needs to be constantly reviewed and updated um, in its representation. Uh, but as a, as a model, I'm pretty impressed. Did you sort of feel um, you were fully involved in the sort of development of the strategy as well? I felt very involved in the development okay. of the strategy at, at various levels, um, at various times, um, and in various encounters, uh, individual conversations and group conversations of the panel um, at various times. So, yeah, I felt fully involved. Thanks for sharing that, John. Anyone else want to come in before we move back to the convener? No? Thanks.
affect yeah. yourself. Thank you, Marie. We're now going to move on from questions from Paul, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, my questions are going to focus on the funding uh, landscape and the funding of, of this work in particular. Uh, I read uh, yesterday um, Samaritan Scotland and Sam H making comment on I suppose, the broader picture of funding around uh, mental health and the fact that uh, I think Samaritan Scotland said there's no indication that the Scottish Government will meet its target in terms of uh, increasing mental health spend to 10 per cent of NHS budget given the challenges. And I think uh, within that quote, uh, Samaritan has also recognised the challenge uh, or, that creating hope together, the strategy is very ambitious, but it requires the funding in order to deliver it. So I, I just wanted to give the opportunity firstly perhaps to Neil and to Dan to, to, to just speak to those quotes and then we'll have a broader uh, conversation. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to reiterate that I, we feel that the strategy is ambitious and in terms of our feeding into the, this strategy, we feel that it, it very much reflects a lot of the priorities that we wanted to see in there. But ambition needs to be met with the appropriate levels of funding and, and resource and um, some of the things that we, we were looking to see is uh, sufficient resource and funding in the system to deliver the support that people need when they need it. And I think the failing to meet the government's own commitment of 10% of frontline funding uh, for mental health services is, is an indication that that is not going to be met and, and is, not a, is not a good sign of where we're going over the next few years. So we, we would certainly like to see um, a greater commitment to funding being put into delivery of the, the strategy. And that, that also means making sure that funding is in the system at frontline so that people who need that support, whether it's in crisis or indeed before that threshold is met, that they have the, the support necessary to, to deal with what, what they're struggling with. Dan? Yes, I agree entirely with, with, with what Neil said. Um, I think there's also an issue around security and longevity. We know that we're looking at making societal-wide changes. One of the things that we I'm speaking for everybody, tend to like about that strategy is that it's ambitious to make societal-wide change but to do that requires significant commitment of resource over a sustained period of time. And we're in a year-to-year -year funding cycle. Um, we don't know, it's hard to plan and spend that money effectively if you don't know where you're going to be in two or three years' time, especially if you want to make those longer-term societal changes. Um, so I, th I think when we, we already talked about the last time that it felt like the suicide prevention work was actually driving the rates down, um, that there was a much more significant amount of resource in and it seems that we have almost learned within Scotland that the rate of spending needs to be much higher if we want to see a result because we've got to remember that it's not just the expenditure on suicide prevention that dictates what the rate is there's other factors at play you know we, we're concerned about um, the cost of living crisis and other financial pressures that people face because we know that's academically established and obviously from lived experience evidence as well that those pressures do increase suicide rates. So if we anticipate things are going to get worse at any point over the next 10 years, we need to recognise that when, when we're anticipating additional pressures, there needs to be additional resource. And really it's you know, how committed are we to getting that, those figures to come down. Um, you know, the resources need to follow the ambition, as, as Neil said. Uh, thank you for, for that. And, and I was interested uh, just in what you said there, Dan, around um, both adequacy of funding but also sustainability of funding. Uh, speaking at SEVO in the Parliament last week, speaking about these issues in a broader context with the voluntary and third sector. But, but I would be interested in terms of the third sector work that's going on in this space, and many people around the table are, are engaged in that. Are there challenges in terms of that year-to-year -year funding with being able to, I suppose, test change and kind of test what works and knowing that you have the, the, the a sense of security to be able to do that because I would imagine within this ambitious plan we want to try and be able to test what works and is that kind of limit of year to year you know funding is that, that holding back I suppose the different initiatives that, that could move forward I don't know if anyone wants to yeah Rob yeah I think it's um I think particularly um, sort of year-to-year -year funding is an issue, and I think generally um, sort of third sector funding. Um, I think probably um, one of um, I think probably the biggest concern around um, a successful implementation of of the strategy and a successful reduction in um, in suicide. 
um, needs to be met by funding. Now, that's across um, a public sector. We're, we're sort of concerned around um, uh, the, the sort of the cuts in um, that health and social care partnerships are, are sort of making, and across different areas, because it, it would take um, action across um, to sort of challenge poverty, inequality, discrimination, stigma, um, um, to reduce uh, sort of rates. Um, in relation to the third sector specifically, I think a lot of our members have have told us that it's it's never been so bad in terms of um, how uh, the funding is, how unpredictable. We did a sort of survey last year that showed that 84% of the member organisations had experienced increased demand for services, partly off the back of the cost of living crisis, uh, but 61 are reporting reduction funding through grants. Um, facing higher bills, unable to play, pay employees, pay uplifts, um, and um, were I think the biggest call was for was for sort of longer term sort of funding arrangements, because um, I think the the sort of um, whilst sort of year to year funding is welcome, it doesn't necessarily give organisations the the certainty to the, to continue pieces of work um, or to sort of progress things beyond um, beyond piloting them. Um, but also their, their ongoing sort of sustainability as organisations. So I think there's um, basically sort of secure, sort of longer term funding for the for the third sector, um, in line with the sort of the fair funding um, principles that, that sort of SEO have suggested. Does anyone else want just Aidan and then I'll come to Jason. Can we <laughs> um, yeah, uh -huh. uh, sorry. I think there is a specific issue with the the year to year funding. Another example we'd like to point to is that we're the strategic outcome lead for the suicide bereavement support service, um, whose final independent evaluation report was recently published last week, which recommended that the service be rolled out nationally across Scotland so that everyone's able to access the service. The independent report showed how invaluable post suicide support was for the whole community. So we're really pleased to see the Scottish government and COSA committing to rolling the the service out further. Um, the issues within funding of that are of the 2.5 million spent in the last year, 600,000 of that has been allocated to the continued funding of the suicide bereavement pilot service and improvement to crisis response. Um, and if the intention is then to roll out the, the pilot, it's currently in two health boards across Scotland, so it would be um, you know, multiplying that sevenfold, we'd be looking at a budget which is more than the total spend of the suicide prevention work that the Scottish Government is currently doing. Um, so we will need additional funding from the Scottish Government in order to finance some of the really, really important work that, that's going on with suicide bereavement support. Jason, come in. Thanks, Paul. Um, just to fill you in a bit with what's going on with us, is 2009, no men's sheds existed in the country, nobody had heard of them before. It took us four years, took me four years, to get the first one open. So since 2013 until now, we have engaged with a successful um, methodology to engage men voluntarily, highly unusual, when it doesn't involve risk with men. And we now have over 200 groups across Scotland engaging over 10,000 men voluntarily across the whole of Scotland, across all sectors. What I don't understand is if this government is serious about what we're wanting to implement here. For the very first time in Scotland's possible history, we actually have a model of engagement where men are voluntarily excited about getting together in a safe place and talking about their vulnerabilities. Why? has the Scottish Government stopped all our funding this year. We're now at a critical point where I can tell you that in the next eight to nine months, unless this gets turned around, we could see a collapse of the whole movement, which will be devastating for the people of Scotland, all of us. Thank you. Can I just bring Neil in, and then I'll move to my next Absolutely, question. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to, to illustrate my, my previous point in terms of um, Samaritans and the service that, that we provide in across Scotland. So we, as you, you may know, our listening volunteers um, provide um, a, a listening service to, to people across Scotland. We provide uh, 12,000, answer 12,000 calls every month. And many of those calls are directed by uh, people who are 
part of, who are getting support from mental health services. So we receive calls from people on psychiatric wards, we receive calls from people who no longer have mental health support over evenings and weekends, um, expecting continuity of care. Um, our services providing that support when the system isn't providing it for them. And I think that's an indication of there not being enough funding in the system to provide the, the support and care that the people need. I think also we, we, we said in our consultation response that it costs us around £600,000 a year to deliver the listing service in Scotland and it, it falls almost entirely on us to raise that money from, public, uh, from the general public. And I think being able to find a settlement with Scottish Government uh, around uh, and a mechanism for funding the third sector that provides a bit more stability, that provides a foundation that allows us to leverage that additional funding to support uh, the, the service that feels so critical to so many is, is absolutely vital and ensures that we can have the listening service there in years to come. I wonder if I can just, just I think on those previous points, which I think were, were very important to hear, I, I mean, is there a sense from government, because I've heard this of other third sector organisations, where funding is late in being announced or being committed to, there's just a sense that organisations will just bridge the gap somehow, or that, you know, that these things will always exist. But actually the challenge, I think, is, as Neil, you outlined there, is actually takes a lot of resource to you know have these things funded by public donation or, or other grants and trusts so you know have people experienced that bridging issue if you like where government's been late in, in delivering funding yeah. Jason you, you, do you want to um, yes we've, we've just experienced that right now with the um, social isolation and loneliness fund where we were told it was a three-year fund Eight months in, going into our second year, there possibly no second year funding. The second year funding, uh, two weeks before we were told that we would have to reduce the budget by 25%, we all rushed around and went, well, can we even employ on that? And we put in our, we had a meeting with all the 56 different charities that were part of that three, I think 3.2 million fund. And literally 24 hours before the end of the financial year, the government did a U-turn and said, no, you can actually have, for this next year only, 100% of the funding. How do you operate like that? Thank you. I, I wonder if I can just finally convene. Yes. Um, I, I think in terms of many of these issues, I, I'm keen to understand if, um, you know, detail in terms of spending related to suicide prevention if that was included in the strategy's progress reports and people had a, a better sense of um, the progress that's being made or not in terms of uh, the allocation of budget, I mean, would that be helpful in terms of, I suppose, a wider picture and trying to plan better? And is that something you would like to see that, you know, committee might want to consider in terms of our conversations with government? Rob? Yes, I think that would be helpful. I think... Um, um, I think we've spoken to the committee before about um, about human rights budgeting and what that is, and, and one of the key points around that is is still sort of transparency. Um, if you tend to look at sort of government's uh, budgets or or sort of health and social care partnership budgets, it can be very difficult to identify precisely what's being spent on which thing, or in this case, sort of suicide prevention. And sometimes it's, it's sort of top line figures. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's been been spent on on sort of other initiatives in the third sector. So I think that, that would be a very, um, that would be a very welcome measure. And I think it would allow us to give us a lot more detail of what's, what's happening on the ground, where some of the funding gaps are, um, and, um, and sort of what's, what's been committed to. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Paul. We'll now move on to questions from Annie Wells, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to, focus on the monitoring and evaluation of the strategy um, and basically the evaluation plan that's detailed in the outcomes framework do you think that's adequate and should there be any additions or changes to that plan um, Dan I'm looking at you first here <laughs> thanks okay um I, th I don't think we've got good news soon that that isn't the extent of the monitoring evaluation that's that the, the published piece is the very high level um, uh, element of work. Uh, 
and there's work now ongoing to, to build the, the, the more practical lower, low levels of engagement. Um, in particular, there's, uh, there's um, I might mean, my, 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 uh, ask uh, Dr. Davies to comment because, uh, because the outcome three, outcome four, sorry, has led, led on this work, but matter of focus um, have been brought on board to take an impact um, an outcome led approach so that they've got a system that we're looking at implementing across across the delivery to enable us to, to look much more closely at being able to demonstrate with a degree of confidence that the work that's being conducted is actually contributing towards the outcomes in the strategy. Um, but I feel for maybe I should let, 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 let Thank you. Talk to that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so you mentioned matter of focus. Um, so they've been um, engaged, and one of the things that they'll be doing is to be able to see whether the activities that are set out in the in the plan will meet the outcomes within the outcome framework. And because that's very important to see whether um, they're enough or you need to change tack a bit. Um, so that's the methodology they're using. And then we also um, have the electronic reporting system that has been um, worked on to pilot um, as well, um, which will be able to determine whether the things we want to collect exist. And if they don't exist, how will we will we be able to have access to the data and information necessary for us to be able to be much more evidence-informed as to what, how to move towards mm -hmm. our outcomes. So all of these things are happening. So what's published in the strategy is kind of high level, and there's a lot of work being done as we speak um, to operationalize the outcomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That, that is good, good news that it's actually getting worked through just now. And the other question, Convener, if I may, it's just um, a follow-up on that as well. Some of the respondents to your call for views <clears throat> had said that maybe focusing on reduction in suicide deaths as an overall measure was maybe not the, the right way to do it. Should that be broadened? Is there anything that we should look at broadening the, the measurement of the strategy's success or not? Neil, thank you. Um, I think a death by suicide is a is a an important measure for for us, but I, I don't think it's sufficient. Um, I think one of the one of the things to acknowledge about the the new strategy that that, that uh, Dan and Dr. Davis has mentioned is this focus on outcomes, which hasn't happened in previous strategies. Mm -hmm. I think. We, sh we should recognise and celebrate the fact that we do have a focus now on understanding whether we are making uh, significant progress. And the work that, that has been done to understand what data we need to, to gather in order to, to uh, understand whether the outcomes have been achieved, I think should make a huge difference if we can make that, that work. I think we don't have access to the data that, that we need. I think we'd certainly encourage a a focus on understanding uh, attempted suicides, because that mm -hmm. would give us a, a better indication alongside deaths by suicide of what more we need to do to address suicidality. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely much more we, we need to do in terms of gathering data and understanding that data. And that's not just from academic research, it's from service insights, it's from mm -hmm. people with lived and living experience and using all of that to help us and inform us about what needs to change. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that. Yes, John. Thank, I, you. thank you. I'd just like to add that the issue of dying by suicide is not a complete science. I, I don't know whether the committee understand that. Um, this came as a bit of a shock to me. So we meet regularly. We work with postvention for the most part, working with families in situations where there has been a suicide. And it's not at all unusual for a family to be de delivered a death certificate that makes no mention of suicide whatsoever. Right. Um, and, and so there is an upstream issue with the Registrar General and how they record mm -hmm. suicidality, um, which I think the country and this committee needs to understand. So it's not quite as clear as saying, um, you know, we found body X um, in certain circumstances, that was definitely a suicide. There is a balance of probabilities issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and that's an important fact. Um, 
And whilst I agree with everyone's comments so far, um, I still don't want to move away from my position that we need to see a reduction in suicides and suicide numbers in Scotland. Okay? So we can measure all the other upstream stuff, and it's important yeah. that we do so. But the end point here, we're talking about a suicide prevention strategy. Mm -hmm. We have to see a reduction in suicide. Mm -hmm. There is no getting away from that. We can't obfuscate it with nicer upstream things. We have to see a reduction in suicide. That has got to be the outcome of the strategy. Yes, Dr. So, 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 so what, what, one, that's why in Public Health Scotland our publications talk about probable suicide mm -hmm. rather than absolute suicide because th there are some grey areas where it's not quite known uh, as to whether it was actually um, suicide. The other thing is, yes, you mentioned some gaps here, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So th these are pieces of data we don't have at all and we're, we're hoping that as time goes on as we deliver this strategy there will be <coughs> pilots to be able to understand how that kind of information can be collected because it's a bit nuanced mm -hmm. um, people need to present themselves or say something to uh, um, a health care or a social care or uh, a, a third sector support structure so that it's recorded somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, then we don't know. Um, so there are quite a number of, of, of challenges. So that's what I just wanted to mm -hmm. add. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. Thank you, convener. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, uh, Karen, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for, for your contributions so far today and uh, previously in, in writing. Um, I've got a couple of issues and questions to explore around uh, support for uh, marginalised and minoritised groups and how how you feel the strategy uh, affects uh, or deals with deals with some of these issues. Um, a, a couple of general questions first, um, if, if I may. Do you think there's enough information in the strategy as it stands to identify who are particularly uh, vulnerable groups, or is that a problematic way of viewing this in the first place? How, what, what, what do you think about Given, given what we know about increased, not only um, figures around suicide itself, but suicidal ideation in, in specific groups, does the strategy get to grips with that enough? And I don't, I don't know, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned this in, in your opening remarks. Do you want to come in on this first? Yeah, I'm happy to come in. I think we'd add, first of all, that we really do welcome the human rights-based approach of the strategy and appreciate um, the importance of reducing suicide deaths for all in society as well. Um, and we do see huge strengths within the strategy. Um, but when it comes to prevalence, specifically within the LGBT community, um, the LGBT Health Needs Assessment, which was published in Scotland in 2022, um, found that nearly one in three LGBT people had tried at one time to end their life. And this was at the intersections, 49% of trans masculine people, 47% of non-binary people, 36% of trans women and 31% of bisexual women. Um, this is alarmingly higher than the population average, which the Scottish Government reported at 7% in 2022. Our own internal data really confirms that this is the reality for LGBT people. Um, our 2023 service evaluation, we had a sample of 332 people who access our services. 64% um, of LGBT people using our services said suicidal ideation is an issue that impacts them. Um, this is 80% for trans and non-binary people, 98% for LGBT people seeking asylum, and 100% for intersex people and those with variation in sex characteristics. Um, I think it's important to recognise prevalence um, and high rates of prevalence specifically. And I think by adopting a truly intersectional approach to both you know, prevention and intervention, as well as the strategy, you can get it right for everyone. Um, that's what we believe. Thanks. Okay. Th thanks, Rebecca. Um, Dan, could I come to you on the same kind of question? Are there, are there particular... Um, issues that, this, that the strategy doesn't doesn't get at if we're talking about particularly vulnerable groups? I, I think um, the strategy is very broad and, and ambitious. So quite often you'll find when you're, you're looking for specific things, there are references. But I think what we're trying to say is that there needs to be a, a greater 
degree of intentionality in, in with individual groups, but we, we've understood that, that this is an area where there hasn't historically been enough done. You know, we, we, Sam Atria were involved in the last action plan with doing some work specifically, particularly focused on racialized communities and looking at some of the asylum challenges. So we're, we're aware, especially here, <laughs> of, of the that there are a large number of groups with very specific challenges mm -hmm. and specific drivers to, to their, their risk factors, which are not, not easy to understand unless you really properly engage, which, which is why we were talking about the need to broaden our lived experience engagement. Um, and I think that's both through making sure there's space for, for those conversations within things like the social movement and using the lived experience panel, but also finding other forums and to engage with organisations in a much more open and inclusive way to, to let um, people who have been facing the discrimination that's driving, in many cases, their, their suicidal ideation, um, let them bring that uh, and that conversation and tell us where, where to go rather than sit back as the Scottish, Scottish Government or the Delivery Collective and assume that we have part of the answers is to really hand power back to those groups. That's, that's where the challenge now is, I think, that we've recognised that those challenges haven't been fully addressed and that there is, there is a lot to learn still. Um, but it's, it's about how we can do that within the capacity. And, and I don't want to make everything back about resource, but you know, yes. those yeah. groups deserve genuine open conversations where there is, not, there is resources to, to take those ideas and those, the, those learnings forward. And if the, if the funding envelope is essentially flat or declining in real terms, the ability to innovate in the way that will be necessary to realistically take on these challenges will be curtailed before the start. And it, I, I don't want to be involved in something where we're going to people, getting them to, re, to, to share their lived experience and then not genuinely using that lived experience. I don't, I don't think that's, that's morally acceptable, frankly. Okay. Thanks, Dan. You mentioned, I'll, I'll come back to you, Rebecca, but you mentioned asylum seekers, but particularly you'll be aware of the work that this committee has done on, on asylum seekers um, last year and suicide and suicidal ideation came up in that. I was, I, I'm just wondering, do you think, and you talk about you know, learning the lessons, I think we, 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 know, we know what we need to do, we just need, in, in so many cases we just need to get on and do it. Do we have the right structures in place? Um, you, you talk, you know, yeah, resources one thing, but it's actually how we get the resources to the right to the right people, either frontline support workers or, or or beyond. Do we have the right structures? Thinking particularly of that vulnerable group of asylum seekers who have so many different strings attached to local uh, Scottish and Westminster uh, and, and UK government agencies in, in different ways that that cut across each other in different ways. There's obviously coordination issues that's particularly strong, and it, I think it is challenging within that group because of the changing nature of the of the communities that you're working with. Yeah. You know, they come with different. You, know, you could gear up to be very good at talking to one one community, and then a year or so later, it's another community that's unfortunately found themselves having to seek asylum. Um, I think it it is. <laughs> I think I probably disagree that the structure the structures are never perfect, um, but they're probably workable with. You know, there are some excellent organisations working with. Uh, asylum, uh, some people seeking asylum uh, already, and you know, they, as you say, they, they know what they need to do. Um, and you know, if resources were made available to them, they could be doing that now. Um, and I think, you know, we can, we, because of the nature of this conversation, we can get tied into process. But there does come a point where we know people are dying. These are individual people. These are real people. This is. Um, a, it's easy to get to draw back and look at the statistics, but we've got to be very mindful of the suffering that each of these deaths causes, and that we we believe they're avoidable deaths, you know. And and I wouldn't want to delay getting resources to those to those organisations that can make a difference by going through a restructuring process. Of, of, you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, so I think you know, the, the structure isn't is not perfect, but it probably is good enough. No, no, that, that, that's really helpful. Rebecca, did you want to come back in? Hi, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to comment on what Dan was referencing around innovation and funding. And I think for us, a huge part of this issue is that there are organisations working with minoritised communities who hold expert knowledge on how to support their communities. And this is specifically true for the LGBT community who have historically supported each other. Um, our own internal data, again, shows that of 62% of people who reported that um, they experienced suicidal ideation, there was a decrease in suicidal thoughts by 57% for trans and non-binary people, 64 by intersex people, and 80% of asylum seekers. I think it's evident that these services 
do exist. They mm. just need to be properly resourced, both in terms of prevention work and intervention work. And in instances where specialist support organisations aren't resourced, those who are providing services need to be LGBT informed and informative because it makes such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, th thanks, Rebecca. And, and one of the things I picked up in, in that was the, the need to, if we are looking at focus groups, actually still to, to retain an intersectional understanding because people will fit into more, more, than, one, more than one of those, those groups at times. Neil, can I come to you with the same sort of general question around um, how, how the strategy supports or are there any gaps in, in it when we're thinking about particularly vulnerable uh, groups or individuals? I mean, I, I would agree with what, what uh, Rebecca and Dan have, have said, so I'll not um, reiterate that, but I think the, I think things can work despite of the structures. I think the, the structure is improved on what we've had previously. I think it's, it's brought third sector in to work alongside uh, government and, and COSLA in delivery of the strategy. I think it can, be, it can feel messy at times, um, but I think there's an attempt to be able to broaden and widen out the, the, the number of stakeholders and, and, and people who can contribute to delivery of this. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And to Rebecca's point of being able to engage with organisations who are already hold those relationships with people who are experiencing harmful stigma and discrimination or experiencing other forms of inequality, that to learn and understand and be guided by their expertise and how we talk about suicide prevention. So I think the, the, the model is, is, is being built as we speak and those relationships are being formed and those networks are being, are being created. So I think, I think we're in a better place with, um, with, a, with a lot of that. I think the other area where we would see hope, I suppose, is, is, how we, is, is the focus on cross-government work and recognising that suicide prevention is a small part of the Scottish Government. And we, we're not going to tackle inequalities in a, uh, through the suicide prevention strategy. We're going to be tackling inequalities by suicide prevention strategy, linking up with all the other parts of government and with COSLA um, to, to, to tackle the root causes of that together. And that, that is a difficult, it's a difficult task, but I think having that ambition Leads the, leads the way and kind of keeps the focus on trying to build those connections across government, uh, which can only be a good thing. Okay, thanks. Um, Richard, if I can come to you, one, one of the groups that we haven't talked about are people who've been in prison and who have been released from prison. And, and you, you, you may be aware, The Lancet recently published um, research on, it was multinational research, but in, included Scottish data from, from eight countries, one of which was Scotland, um, that found that this suicide being the second highest cause of death post-release in the first week post-release. And I just wondered, it, it, within Public Health Scotland, are we, are we making those, those kinds of connections that, that Neil has just been talking about? Are we, are we gathering the right kind of data? And it, it links back to one of the, Annie's questions, actually, around you know, how, we, how we collect data, how we use that data, and therefore how we feed it into the strategic work that we do. Yeah, that's right. So um, th there are some data gaps, there are some data challenges to actually drill down. But what we know is the more deprived you are, you are three times as likely to take your life. And also, if you're a man, you're three times as likely to take your life compared to a woman. Prisoners fall into both. Most of them are men and most of them are in the very deprived area. So therein lies the problem. So um, we would like, um, because we're working with QES, um, who will be uh, piloting a huge data set of, of about 100 variables um, within some local areas to understand whether that data exists, whether it can be captured quite quickly. So it's granular data about individuals um, who have died by suicide. So better understand um, what is going on. Um, and we also plan to publish on the 7th of May uh, uh, statistics on, on data about the individuals who have died, what services they interacted with prior to death. Um, so trying to understand much in, in, in a more granular form as to 
what is it about these individuals uh, um, that led to their death? And how can systems be put in place, attitudes be changed, uh, um, thinking be changed? With all the work we're doing, such as the training for those who provide care or those who provide, who interact with people who have suicidal ideation, because there are lots of resources that have been developed um, collaboratively. Um, NES, um, NHS Education for Scotland, is also uh, um, actively involved as well. Um, to see how these things could be better harnessed and see what difference they would make over time. Okay. So, thank, and thank you for, for raising yeah. NES because I think there's some fantastic resources there and yes. it's just about getting those out to the right Maybe. people. I'm wondering whether we also need to think about the sort of cross-departmental education and training and support, you know, so, so people who are who are dealing, who are supporting um, post-release uh, prisoners post-release? You know, yes. do they have that training? Can they access exactly the same training because it, it already exists? Yes. Let's not reinvent the wheel exactly. multiple times ac ac across government. I'll, I'll look out for that report in, in yep. May. Thank you. Okay. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. We'll now move on to questions from Evelyn Tweet, please. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Thanks for all your answers so far. I would like to ask John. Um, from the Canmore Trust's point of view, about postvention. Can you explain to the committee what postvention is and why it's so important? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and there is no doubt that up until recently, postvention has been low on the agenda. But if I tell you what it is, first of all, postvention is good quality support to individuals, families, communities, schools, colleges, universities and workplaces where there has been a suicide. Um, and that reaches out in many different ways. Uh, we all grieve differently. Uh, companies, workplaces grieve differently. For some people, it's uh, getting straight back to work. Uh, and for some, it's off being sick for six weeks and it's balancing all of that out and supporting that in, in the workplace um, is really important. Why is it important? Why is postvention important? Well, if you summate the world literature on suicide postvention, um, there is a suggestion that uh, for an individual family member who has lost a relative, a first degree relative to suicide, they too carry a lifetime increased risk, a lifetime increased risk of 15% additional suicidality. And so the adage that we have in the Canmore Trust is that today's good quality postvention is tomorrow's prevention. And it's a really important adage. What's really exciting for us is that we, we've come to this, we're a new charity, uh, we've been going for two years, but we come at a time when postvention is definitely coming onto the agenda. But I, I would say something uh, to the committee, which is an important thing, and, and, and it affects all that we're discussing today. And that is that there are many people working in this sector um, and we need a much more joined up approach to all aspects of what we're doing. Whether government agency, uh, whether um, in employment, uh, whether a third sector organisation. And the reason for that is that we, when we pull together, we're much more efficient and we stop duplicating effort and possibly more important than that, duplicating either donated funds or public funds. And so we really do need to work harder at this. And, and I think there is a role for government here in saying, here is the initiative that we're kicking off. Who's interested in this? But more importantly, who's already working in this area? What expertise can we bring to the table? So that's really important that we build that relationship. Now, Scottish Government and COSLA have already done this. They've kicked off. So we've had two uh, major events, uh, one in February, one in March, if I'm right. Um, which brought together the third sector working in suicide prevention and postvention together. And it was a great, both of them were great events. I was at the first one, not at the second one. But there was this sense of, my goodness, you're doing that. Well, we're doing this as well. Let's get together and share our experience and, and share our approach to this. Um, and that has got to be something that we work on going forward. Thank you. I was very interested in the comments you had made about your research on a biological or genetic link to suicide. Um, where are you with that research? Have you got 
anything that you can share or time scale? So it isn't actually going public yet. It's just about to oh, go sorry. public. No, no, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> fine, because if you want me to go public, I'll go public now. Here's a great <laughs> opportunity. So um, Canberra Trust have fundraised um, specifically to open up um, effectively a new seam of research in the University of Glasgow, um, building on Rory O'Connor's psychological um, research uh, in his uh, major department um, in, in Glasgow. Sitting alongside that will be a new seam of biological research. Um, and, and here's another point which I would really like to make, and it came on um, uh, Ms Chapman's uh, tail end of her questions about um, groups affected, because one of the things that I think we're going to have to work hard in the uh, Creating Hope Together strategy to do is to identify that there are high-risk professional groups as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's something that um, we have to work hard in the UK to actually dig out. So it's a freedom of information request issue rather than something that is actively published. Mm -hmm. um, so my son was a veterinary surgeon. Um, the vet suicide rate is four times the national average. Um, the, it would appear that the high suicide rates of, of the four uh, of the six high suicide rates in professional groups, as much as we can work that out, four of them are clinical facing professions. So that's vets, medicines, doc vet, vet medicine, medicine doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the first time we're having a national conference in Glasgow, two day conference in, in November, looking specifically at this matter as to how we might pull information together on this, because it's a really important uh, area. And just to reference Jim Hume, who's sitting behind me, who chairs um, the Scottish Mental Rural Health Forum, uh, Change Mental Health hosts that. Um, rurality is another aspect that we haven't addressed today. And I came to suicide thinking it's got to be something that's about poverty in, in, in urban areas. It's not. It may be about poverty, but it's about rurality. Rurality is a huge factor in this. And so the stuff that Jim's doing, who sits behind me, pulling together the Scottish Rural Mental Health Forum into a group that is cohesive and does an amazing job um, in discussing research opportunities as well. So um, I hope that answers your question. That was great. Thank you. Um, can I ask Rob Gowns about gambling, debt, are we doing enough to look at these issues? I'm thinking cost of living crisis, you know, MSPs will be like me. We have very full inboxes of people struggling. Um, are we doing an, enough to look at these areas? Um, I think there's a lot more that, that can be done. Um, and um, I'm pleased you mentioned it because it's, um, it's an area that we've been um, doing sort of quite a bit of work on over the... Um, the past few years because we know that um, that there's a strong link between um, people who have experienced gambling harm and suicide um, and that um, that is a, a sort of particular particular risk um, so we've um, in, from our Scotland reducing gambling harms program and what uh, that does is to um, people who have got uh, lived experience of gambling harms and to put them at the this at the heart of the the, the policy making policy making process in terms of sharing their experiences. Um, I think in um, in terms of um, so far, I think it's it's sort of been a, a sort of mixed picture. I think there's an increased recognition that um, gambling harms are um, are a public health issue. Um, but I think as as sort of you alluded to in a question, I think it's um, it can often be a, a sort of a question of of sort of priority. That um, it's not necessarily given um, given the sort of attention it needs. I think, in the elementary sense, is um, because um, some of the powers around um, around sort of, sort of gambling and, and sort of gaming restrictions are are reserved. There can sometimes be a bit of a mm -hmm. between um, yeah. something at the the sort of the UK Parliament, and um, because some of it isn't. The direct responsibility of the Scottish government that it can fall off off the radar a bit, but I think it's um, it's absolutely it's um, um, it's a, a kind of a really important group to consider as well because there's you know that there's a, a sort of very strong link and um, this estimated around between 250 to 650 gambling related suicides every year in, in the UK. So um, it's yeah, it's very important to consider as part of this. 
Could I come in on the gambling issue? Because the research is quite clear on it that, for the most part, suicide is a multifactorial disorder. It's pieces of a jigsaw going in. But the one area that can be a unifactor in suicide is gambling. So gambling debt becomes a unifactor, and it can happen very acutely and very suddenly. So it is an area that needs further research and further understanding. Okay. Thank you for that. Cool. Yes, sure. And then, so, so uh, Public Health Scotland, um, gambling is a significant public health issue, um, clearly because there's the tie with poverty and debt and crime, and it just goes on and on. Um, so we, we are trying to explore possibilities for capturing um, good enough data, which we can publish, um, to provide more evidence in that kind of area as to what is happening with regards to gambling harms. Yeah. That's important. Thanks, Kadia. Thank you. Um, before we're going to move on to questions from Megan Gallagher, I'd just like to ask a question myself, if I may, in regards to we're, we're talking about other groups, and it just it came to my mind. We have um, discussed um, postnatal women and also menopausal women. Has that been something that has come up with anyone, no. Dr. Davies? Yes. Yeah, so. Um so, so before we, in, in preparing our publications on, on suicide, we normally use the information from NIS, um, which states uh, um, how people have died. And also, we do have other pieces of information about the, the, the um, maternity system. Mm -hmm. And so we try to link them to understand, because you know, postnatal depression, um, which could um, develop, if not treated quite early, into mm -hmm. um, psychotic type symptoms as well, um, and, and see that relationship between um, pregnancy and birth and, and, and suicide. So yes, so that's okay. something we are working on. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Megan Gallagher. Thank you very much, convener, and thank you everyone for your contributions so far. It's a hugely important topic, um, and I think this has actually brought to light a, a lot of work actually that needs to be undertaken, um, not just by committee but by the Scottish Government themselves to look at how we prevent suicide, but actually how we make sure we've got the right support and funding in place where it needs to be to make sure that everyone is supported who's going through what must be a hugely, hugely difficult time. Um, I'm going to focus more so on men today and the reason I'm focusing more so on men is because the, the statistics and the facts they speak for themselves because 75% of people who died by suicide in 2021 were men and of course we heard um, the statistics uh, back at the start from Neil um, in terms of it's three, three times sorry, more likely for men to die by suicide so I think although we do need to look across different groups of people and people will fall into more than one group within society, um, there is clearly um, a, a need to focus in on why um, that happens, particularly within uh, men within certain age groups and certain demographics and certain uh, reasons why, but also uh, why that hasn't been perhaps more brought to the forefront forward and forefront of the Scottish Government's strategy and what they need to do to try and address that issue. Um, so if I can start with Jason, because you mentioned earlier on a strategy and not to be uh, scared to look at different groups on their own. So I'm just wondering, would you be able to expand a little bit on that, just from your experiences in terms of men's sheds, uh, perhaps just to re-emphasise the, the importance of them, but also the, the difficulties that you've experienced recently in relation to funding um, of that vital important project sure so what we've seen is that um, if we look at our whole culture basically um, it's falling short as in a well-being economy so what we we have to look at possibly while well, we've inherited what we have from our past grandfathers grandmothers etc etc so we have this strong and silent type masculine model which um, in the men's shed movement we are now pushing that we have a strong um, vulnerable, kind, and communicative type of man that we want. So unless we have these environments where this can actually be experienced, it's never experienced. What we find is that men, and I'm generally uh, generalizing here between the two genders or many genders, is that men tend to be hardwired for isolation. So when we become solution focused with our problems, very single focused, men 
find the solution or they don't. If we don't, what we can happen to us is that we internalize, we call it going into the man cave, we'll internalize the issue. If we don't come up with a solution, we can drop into depression. If we still can't speak about it or don't have a safe place to speak about it, we often go and commit suicide. This is the difference that we see between the men and women, where the women will, um, are network communicators of our, of our, of our um, species. You will pick up the phone and speak to a girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera. Men generally do not do that. So our solution is, if I am not here, that's the solution. And it's often the wife is the last person to find out of employed and unemployed people. What we found, and I found fascinating in this men's shed movement, is that the first men's shed in Scotland is in a very wealthy area. Now, if we look at the report, the deprivation areas, which we would think is the given, is not the case. Why, is, why did the local GPs, etc., have concerns about these wealthy, retired oil guys? Because they have time on their hands. And what we find that whether you're in a block of flats surrounded by people, or whether you're in a croft on the islands, or whether you're a farmer on your tractor for hours and hours and hours, that because we are more focused on internal isolation by our gender-specific and solution-based, we will be proactive in doing something risky. So we're talking about gambling, and we're talking about drinking. Our patron, Sir Harry Burns, um, who are very proud to have standing with us. Alcohol, Scotland, as he said, is one of the biggest issues we have. So we have to actually look at why are we drinking or why are we gambling? And what we've seen is I was a youth worker for 10 years. Um, the Scottish Men's Sheds movement is intergenerational, unlike the Australian movement where it came from, which is really looking at retired people. In Scotland, we're looking at the intergenerational approach. So if you're 18 and older, have time on your hands as a man, get yourself down to a men's shed. Now, one of the biggest issues we have in Scotland is this aging population. And in 15 years, 20 years time max, we can have a mass depopulation of people in the country. So what that means in the men's shed movement is what we're missing in our culture, I believe, is having our elders, our wisdom keepers, which we always had in our villages. The Industrial Revolution, unfortunately, changed all of that for us is that one, our, I believe, our culture doesn't value, particularly with men, older people. That's a major issue. The second major issue that I see is that older people couldn't be accessed, and this is why I started the movement. I was looking for older men to mentor me, be a better father. And as John was saying, in 2009, I nearly took my own life as well. So it's coming from a very personal place. And I was in that dark place that I thankfully heard about the Men's Shed movement by a GP who was in Scotland at the time from New Zealand who gave a talk on it. And I was in that very dark place for myself as a father of that age group we're talking about who was contemplating suicide, that I started the movement because I couldn't see in our culture, in the world, that there was something outside of the betting shop and outside of the pub which wasn't leading to risky behavior, that men could go, socialize in a healthy way, and have a purpose again. And we find with the masculine model that if we don't have purpose, that we drop into depression and suicide very quickly. I have studied and been trained in suicide prevention as a youth worker. I've worked in two different types of communities, wealthy and poor, looked at those kids, looked at the boys, and with single parenting today, a lot of the mothers come to me and say, is there no place where I can send my teenage boy to be mentored by a healthy masculine man? Dad is no longer around. So where are these places? Well, they didn't exist. Thankfully, they do now. Over these 10 years, we now have accessibility to older men who are meeting in a masculine, mature, grounded way, which we haven't seen before, often in our culture. And these younger men, if we can change the culture to say our elders are valuable resources, these people in the past have lived through hell and high waters, and you're probably going through the same thing as a younger man. You can learn from these men, from their learnt experience. 
in a safe place. And a nurse recently from Ken Ross said to me, you know, there's an adage that Scottish men particularly are very difficult to talk to, or they just don't talk. And she said, Jason, my experience with working with the men's shed in Ken Ross is we need to change that. The differences now that I see as a nurse for the NHS is that if we create a place or where there is a place where men feel safe, they will open up and speak about their deepest, darkest, shameful secrets. And we honestly, after 10 years or 15 years of doing this now, this weird thing called the men's shed, why a men's shed of all the models that get men excited, I don't know. But we see it's become a global health movement. And it is now the biggest health movement in Scotland for men who are voluntarily engaging across all ages. It is fantastic. And it's, I'm very proud to be a part of it, of course. And I'm also very concerned that it's about to disappear again. Maybe that's answered some of this deep topic. No, it, it definitely has, and I, I am hugely concerned about this for the reasons that you've, you've articulated so so well today. I mean, it is so important that, as you say, there is a safe place for men to talk because us women, we will, you know, go and, as you say, congregate and get all of the weight off our shoulders. Men won't automatically do that. And again, you've you've highlighted another excellent point in terms of role models and you know bringing up that next generation next generation of men that can be confident in themselves but also have somewhere to go and they'll know for a fact that they'll feel open and welcome and it won't be an, an alien situation to them and i think that's hugely important in terms of the funding for men's sheds because you know in my view if this goes i am terribly concerned about the impact that that's going to have and already concerning statistics when we look at men in general. What, what, is, the, what is the time frame? You said eight to nine months uh, in terms of, and what happens? Is that men's sheds in rural areas that go first? Is that men's sheds in urban areas? You know, how, how could that be condensed? Because I'm pretty certain that every single men's shed right across Scotland has a worth and a purpose and it serves so many men. I think it's 3,000 members that you've got as well. So our, our charity has nearly 4,000 members now, wow. just our charity. Yeah. The movement engages over 10,000 men every week. That is the biggest charity, I believe, now in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Why the government chooses not to fund it, and if we look at the uh, examples of Australia, who is now <laughs> 30 years on, they have over 1,000 men's sheds, they are funded at $4.5 million a year. 30 years on, if we look at Ireland, who's very similar to Scotland in their demographics and their rural population, the, Scottish gov uh, the Irish government funded 1.3 million last year. The biggest impact at the moment in, in, in Scottish sheds is the cost of electricity. And unfortunately, like Ireland, we don't have fantastic weather. So the cost of electricity is a major impact on them. The Irish government recognised that and gave them 800,000 euros over winter that each men's shed could have 2,000 euros to keep the lights on, keep the heating on, keep the basic need of people getting together over the dark times. Unfortunately, in Scotland, what we're finding is post-COVID, a lot of these elders who are the uh, nuts and bolts of the movement and have this life experience, so there are the trustees. And you need to understand that this movement is very unique. Why is it that men are being engaged in this way and they're not being engaged in, in other models? And it's because we run an ethos of engaging and empowering the men. So it's for the men, by the men. So we don't, as the support hub, we are not the umbrella organization which runs every shed. That doesn't engage men. What engages men is giving them self-governance over their own actions. So as the support hub for Scotland, we provide them all their policies. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. Men generally hate paperwork. They just want to get into the shed and socialise and help their communities, green footprint, carbon footprint, all that good stuff that happens in the sheds is obviously there as well. But the main thing is about purpose. They need a purpose to get out the house. In the shed world, 
We call it that men communicate shoulder to shoulder, women communicate face to face. So unless we have a purpose, the man doesn't leave the house. And in the shed world, we call it, the wives call it the underfoot syndrome. So our husbands, for whatever reason, unemployed, underemployed, had an accident, lost their job, uh, retired, whatever, sickness, get under our wives' feet. So our wives no longer have their own independent space, and he just sits there. And many, I'm talking hundreds of wives, have said to me, my husband is becoming a child. I am losing my partner. When he has a place to go to, which is risk eliminated, called the men's shed, he comes back with a spring in his step. He brings conversation back to the marriage. He's given her her personal space again. The marriage stays intact, and she keeps a husband. So the impact on the movement, we say if every man who goes to men's shed will minimally impact positively on five people in that day. If he doesn't, lose, if he doesn't move and lose the house, five people, four people, four or five people are missing out on his interactions in his community, big and small. Yeah. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people being impacted. And... It's something that's been missed, I believe, strongly, that if we look at the research, we did 150,000 with Glasgow Caledonia University research. The research is in there, four years research, to say that this model works. Ireland is proving this. They have, more, they have double the amount of sheds that we had. Post-COVID, we're now finding fatigue in the trustees. And we don't have a legacy. My big concern is that our charity will close in eight to nine months. We have no more funding. We do not have enough to cover them. These men are all volunteers. We are the central hub that they go to for their go-to. So from how do I start a shed to how do I keep the shed running, they come to us. We have developed a strategy unique to Scotland with its devolved laws. And I'm very proud to say that we've exported this development strategy to America and Canada, who have taken our little Scottish development model, which is now rolling across the world, and we're about to close. Devastated. I think if, if that doesn't tell us how important men's sheds are, I, I don't know what else will. And I think, you know, we've got, and I'm just trying to, to link it to other things, we've got veterans uh, groups for a purpose. We have got women's aid, for example, for a purpose. And I just fully, fully, wholeheartedly believe that we have men's sheds for a purpose. So thank you very much, Jason. I'm sorry um, I didn't widen that out. But I, I do believe that we need to emphasise um, one of the, the, the biggest groups that are impacted by suicide. And I understand that will, of course, expand over over all of the charities that are being covered today. Um, but I just feel as though that it needs to be put on record. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in um, on that point. Yes, please. Yeah, just maybe to, to, to build on, on, on that. I think looking at the, the role of, of sports and culture and, and um, those spaces where, where, where men meet, I think is, is really important to, to look at how we can provide training and support in those areas so that men have the, the space where they can, they can talk more openly. Um, I think uh, in addition to that, looking at, at training at, at the at frontline services, not just within mental health services, but also in education, job centres, housing support, um, people at the front line who are customer facing who can recognize distress and those signs in men in particular and be able to recognize that provide the principles of time space compassion and signpost men to the support that might make make a difference is also uh, uh, really important to, to focus on and then just one last point I think one of the aspects that I think that's in the strategy and that we're we're leading on as part of the strategy is looking at re reducing access to means and restricting access to means, I think particularly with, with men, where uh, some of the evidence suggests that more lethal means might be used within, within, uh, with, with men could make a, a massive difference in helping to disrupt that plan to create space where intervention can be, can be brought in and support can be provided. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> get to there. I, all I would say is agreeing with <laughs> what my colleagues have said. Um, I've now walked with literally thousands of men um, in crisis. And we're back to addiction again, because one of the major things that comes out in discussion is pornography. Pornography has become a major addictive issue for men. Um, and I, I think if we're going to speak about addiction and the completeness of factors in suicidality, then we have to put pornography on the table. It is a hugely addictive process for men. Um, as they become more disconnected from families, their jobs, communities, it's something that uh, many men uh, dip into and sink into, and it becomes a mire that they find great difficulty getting out. It influences the relationships, influences a whole host of things. So um, pornography needs to be put as one of a major factor in suicidality and thinking. And it's one that we, we, we don't speak of we don't. at all. But that is, it's definitely a point that we, we should address. So just a quick one. Uh, um, the other consideration is most of the men who have taken their lives have been in employment, so they've been working. But what we don't have is the, the quality of the jobs that they've been involved in or how risky some of those jobs have been or how stressful some of those jobs have been. But majority of them have been uh, in employment. Yeah. yeah. So it is about data harnessing at this yeah. point in time, you know, to, to, to create that prevention, because if yeah. we don't know what causes, we can't prevent. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a whole cycle of how do we get this right but there's a lot of factors I think whilst we've got a, a strategy mm -hmm. there's still chains of the link that the links of the chain sorry that are missing um, so there's a lot more work to do sorry Aidan and then yes. um, so I think um, sp specifically with men uh, we need to get better at talking about suicide in a safe way so that people know what to do when someone tells them that they're struggling and to break down that stigma and the feelings of shame <clears throat> And embarrassment. I think what John pointed out earlier about rural areas is very important. We're a charity that 80% of the people we support are in rural Scotland. Um, and we know from the latest statistics that Highlands, uh, Tayside and Asian Arran are some of the highest areas with suicide mortality rates. Um, and some of the specific issues within rural Scotland is not just a lack of access to services through remoteness, but it's also uh, people are emotionally isolated with two thirds of respondents um, from our 2017 study saying they couldn't be open within their own community about their mental health in a rural area. So it's the double edged sword of a lack of uh, being physically isolated from services, but also emotional <coughs> isolation. Um, I think that has to be put on the record. Um, something that, I, that is very dear to my heart, which we probably haven't spoken about today, is the military and the suicides in our military. I'm a veteran myself. I'm a Marine. I've been to war. Um, a lot of my colleagues have committed suicide. And I'm not sure about this, but from what I hear is that the MOD doesn't really release information too much about suicides. I would like that to be recognized, spoken about, and changed for sure. And we can see from our research that about 15 to 16 percent of the sheds that we have um, researched on are ex-police, fire, or military men that are now going to the men's sheds and are getting that. And what we hear from the veterans is that they miss the camaraderie, they sometimes miss the dark humor on how to deal with incredibly traumatic and PTSD situations. And they find it, again, in some shape and form, not in civilian life, but they find it with the camaraderie and the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder banter that happens in the men's shed in this protective male characteristics place that is there. And I don't think our veterans or our MOD uh, is doing fair justice to our men and, our, and the impact on our families and the homelessness that happens largely in this uh, veteran community that we're faced with in Scotland. No, thank you very much for that. And that, again, is a, another issue that's really close to my heart. So thank you very much again for, for raising those points. Convena, I'm conscious of time, but thank you very much for, for that. No, no problem at all. I, I know, John, I would like to come in. If you'd like to it's come just in. to go, there's, there's something that we haven't talked about today, and it's we touched on it with Ness, we touched on it, Aidan touched on it about um, educating people how to deal with men who are feeling suicidal. So education is a major part of something that we haven't talked about today. And the strategy talks about children and young people coming on board with the whole issue of benefits from this strategy. Mm -hmm. 
And I feel very strongly about this, and I think we're in danger of jumping round or hedging round this. We need to educate our young people in schools um, about how to deal with suicidality and suicidal thinking. And I hear this from parents all the time. So we, uh, Rory O'Connor's work has shown that one in five, 20% of young Scottish men and women under the age of 35 will experience significant suicidal ideation. We don't know who they are, we can't do a blood test. So we need to identify a way of educating the whole community as to how to react in a suicidal crisis situation. So we, we can't skip this anymore. I'm aware that we're waiting for major evidence to say this is what we need to do. We're going to wait a long, long time. We need to be bold in Scotland and take a, a stance on educating our young people in schools, colleges and universities about suicidal thinking and, importantly, suicidal safety planning. Really, really important. Thank you for that important contribution, John. I am... Um of course, uh, following on from that, I, th I think as well, a group we haven't touched on perhaps are neurodivergent people, autistic uh, uh, and ADHD. And we know that within that community and that group, they have done some studies uh, and have data on the um, mortality rates of, of those individuals. And I think from what we're hearing today, there is you know, a, a vast amount of data out there, still some needing to be gathered, but we need to... Um, have this streamlined in, in, in some sort of way. Now, I, I would just, that's all our members have, have asked their questions, but I just want to take this opportunity to ensure that everybody has said anything that they would like to get on record today. So if there is anything that you would like to raise at this point before we close this session, um, please, um, please indicate. Uh, Dan? Thanks very much. I just wanted, to, uh, we haven't really talked about the importance of the link between uh, Scottish Government and, and local government. We've referenced Costler okay. a few times. I think we need to recognise the, the, the vast value in the work that goes on uh, across Scotland through the local delivery leads and, and other local initiatives. Um, and uh, as Sam H, we're, we're very proud of the work we do in Grampian, uh, which is coordinating between several local authorities, uh, local police, um, fire and rescue uh, and the NHS. Uh, to try and take an approach that, that lets embed suicide prevention work in the, in, in the real-time data that's generated uh, locally and also in, in that network of supports because we've talked a lot about the importance of getting appropriate support for the, for the issues that people are facing and being able to understand the, the communities. And, um, and so really a lot of that work has to be done locally. Everything, everything is local eventually. Um, and, uh, and I think when we talked about funding and the importance of, uh, of secure funding and funding going forward and being, funding being preserved to suicide prevention, we, we quickly started talking about the third sector. But I think we need to understand that a lot of that work's done through local government funding as well. And as we're thinking about a, a more secure funding structure for suicide prevention, and us all working together in the cross-sectoral way that we, we, are, we all believe in, mm -hmm. then we need to recognise that, that protecting some of the funding within local government would be very important to achieving that. Thank you. Uh, John, you indicated. I always like to end on a positive note. Um, with 762 suicides a year in Scotland, uh, there's a massive number. There's a, an army of lived and living experienced people out there mm -hmm. who come from all kinds of backgrounds, neurodiverse, LGBT, uh, the military, a whole host of backgrounds. We need to bring those individuals on board to share their, ex their story, to share their experience, because that's a preventive mechanism in itself. Sharing stories is helpful for those sharing, but it's absolutely helpful and saves lives um, for yeah. those who are, who are hearing it. So we need to involve the lived and living experience folks and that, in that community. We call it the suicide community, the suicide family. We need to use them much more. Um, they're sitting there waiting to be used. We need to use them um, uh, as part of an army going forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Aidan? Yes, just uh, briefly, I think um, regarding the strategy, a, a sufficient measure of success will be building a wide network of, of community-based mental health supports that are able to provide support for those in need across Scotland. And we know that people want to be supported pre-crisis and they want to be supported in their local community. And there's great work ongoing at the moment. The Scottish Government have committed to rolling out the Suicide Bereavement Support Service in order to break that link um, between people experiencing a suicide in their close family. 
and we've also got things like the Distress Brief Intervention Programme, which are being rolled out across Scotland, which has direct benefits to breaking the link um, within people um, considering suicide. Um, but we've got to think about that wider network of support that we're providing for people all across <coughs> Scotland. So, yeah, what, just to follow up on what you were saying, you know, prevention works. Uh, um, the evidence is very, very clear. It's a very cost-effective intervention. Um, it involves collaboration. It involves people coming together to change attitudes. Um, it's not just all about money. Yes, money is absolutely important, but it's not just all about money as well. Um, there's a lot of things about changing attitudes and also for um, providing learning and training resources to make people more resilient, um, to be able to cope with all the vagaries and inconstancies of life, and also to be able to make, make, have the correct type of data, research, to be able to build on the evidence so that we are seeing a clear picture, a clear pattern of what is going on, to understand and learn from every single death that happens, um, particularly for, for death reviews as well, whoever you are. Um, to make sure there is a guaranteed review of the death and the learning that comes up from that death as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Rebecca, did you indicate what I take in, Jason? Yeah, yeah I'll, yes, I'll, I'll come in. Um, I just wanted to come in on basically looking forward for us into the action plan phase and the next stages um, of development with regards to the suicide prevention strategy. I'm thinking about ways in which people can be involved, minoritised communities can be involved, those um, at risk and with prevalence of suicidal ideation and completion. And I guess I'd just like to say on record that we welcome that the Scottish Government mentioned in the strategy that they are willing to invite new members to join this um, National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group um, and subsequent boards. And we would encourage the Scottish Government to ensure that the group is diverse and representative mm -hmm. regarding the prevalence of suicidal ideation. Um, and we hope that that will be extended to all minoritised groups who experience prevalence of suicide, including LGBT people, asylum seekers, and neurodivergent folk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jason? I'd just like to, to bring um, some attention to something that I, ex I experienced the other day with Fathers Network Scotland. Uh, a lady came on and gave a presentation about, and I've never heard of this before, so I want to put it on record today, about pre- and postnatal depression for fathers and their suicides. Uh, her husband committed suicide, and she is running a campaign um, around the world now about bringing awareness to this, about the impact of, of this depression that happens with fathers. And with a silent and strong mentality, we do not speak about it at all. It was very deep and very moving. And the second thing I'd like to bring about, we mentioned menopause and the impact of menopause. Something that I, that I speak about um, in, the, in the movement is andropause which very few people have even heard of. And this is the male menopause. And it generally happens to men 10 years after the given 50-year-old menopause for women. So when our testosterone and our estrogen levels change, it changes for men as well. And this has an impact on the marriage, impacts on the men, our uh, ability to move or not move. And it's not really spoken about. So it's back to education, education, about the biological differences that happens between the two genders and how we can support our partners through understanding and education, and for the kids to understand that dad is now in a very different place to where he was the go-to firefighting kind of hero, where now he actually wants to sit around and do nothing, and mom's moving into the let's get up and go thing. And this isn't spoken about at all across our nation. And I think it's, again, it's education that desperately needs to be spoken about in families and understood. Thank you. Neil. Thank you. Just to raise two, two or three points that I don't think um, that we've, we've spoken about. Maybe just to emphasise Dan's point about funding and funding to frontline services on the ground and looking at how we support local councils in the delivery, I think is really, is really critical. Um, the role of media, uh, we, we've, we've not talked about. And I think that is another area where we can see potential for increased risk through how media reports on, on suicide and talks about suicide okay. and, and creates an environment where um, that potentially can increase uh, risk for, 
for, for, uh, for, for people. So one of the aspects of the strategy that's looking at how suicide is reported more responsibly. Mm -hmm. So trying to build in more, more of a focus on stories of hope and recovery, I think would, would, be, mm -hmm. would be really good. And Samaritan's Media Guidelines is, is something that we, we put out there often to media uh, companies and to, to help guide reporting around this issue. Um, the role of private sector, we've, we've not talked about mm -hmm. either. I think in terms of private sector companies, particularly financial institutions, energy mm -hmm. providers that are dealing every day with vulnerable customers and thinking about the training and support that those private sector companies could be building into their, their, um, their workforces to ensure mm -hmm. that those customer facing roles, um, those people have the skills and the confidence to be able to, to support people who are vulnerable, who are dealing with the cost of living issues that they're experiencing, pressures on their finances uh, and so forth. So I think that's an area that, that we should be paying more attention to. Private mm -hmm. sector could play a big role um, in alleviating distress for many that are under particularly yeah. financial um, yeah. pressure. Okay, thank you. I think that's that's us completed our session today. So I just want to once again thank everyone for participating. It's been quite a thorough session and um, your, your contributions are, are noted and recorded. We will now suspend briefly while we go into private session. Thank you.